meeting of the Planning Board and the Zoning Board of Appeals. Uh, everybody is here for, uh, for really one issue. Um, there will be a couple of administrative things to get through first. Is anybody here for public comment that is not for a comment related to the application tonight on any other matters? All right, so moving forward, I'd like to remind everybody that this meeting is broadcast live and digitally recorded. This meeting is being held both in person and virtually through Zoom, pursuant to Governor Baker extending the COVID-19 rules allowing public meetings to be conducted remotely so that board and committee members as well as members of the public can participate remotely. Uh, we didn't have any minutes distributed for this meeting to approve uh, and we we're going to forego action items, so we we're going to jump into new business. And the new business is a public hearing, and because there are two boards here, uh, the ZBA needs to also open its meeting, and then we'll open the public hearings. Can I have a motion to op open our meeting? Okay, motion. We open no. our meeting. Can so I second. second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. And just recognizing that we do have a quorum of the planning board for the record and the quorum uh, consisting of John Damalia, Alice Livedahl, Francois Steiger, and we have our alternate member, Erica Dash. Uh, so, we down the list here. Uh, on behalf of the planning board, I'm opening the public meeting for the application, uh, let's see. I'm opening the public meeting to consider the application for a special permit to the planning board to construct a cell tower in Hubbardston by Vertex Towers LLC. And we will also need the ZBA to open their public hearing. May have a motion to open our public. I will hearing. make that motion. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. So, as a order of um, a process tonight, we're going to have the applicant present uh, the application and um, provide all the information that he has available, and then we are going to turn the meeting over to the ZBA for the ZBA to ask questions related to portions of uh, the application. And then we are going to have the planning board go and ask questions uh, related to the portion of the special permit that is in front of the planning board. Uh, after we do that, we'll then open for public comment. Uh, and depending upon what we have for questions and how we're doing for time, uh, we will either have the applicant respond to the questions individually or we'll save the applicant's response for the end, depending upon how we're doing for time. So, with that said, Mr. Parisi. Um, good evening. Uh, my name is Francis Parisi, representing the applicant Vertex Towers, LLC. Also on the Zoom with us is Tom Johnson, the civil engineer who designed the project. I haven't actually seen him, I don't know if you can see him. Uh, uh, we are here tonight, as was read in the notice, seeking a special permit from the planning board and a um, variance from the zoning board for a wireless telecommunications facility, which is what your bylaw calls it, but I think we all in the real world call it a cell tower. Uh, um, the property is located at 14 Main Street. However, because of some access issues, access to the facility will be over one adjacent parcel located at 9 Brigham Street. And then, unfortunately, when our surveyors are out there, we found out a portion of the driveway on 9 Brigham Street is actually on 7 Brigham Street. So in order to use that driveway, we also secured the right to cross 7 Brigham Street. But we're really crossing about five feet of space. So it was just a technicality uh, that the surveyors found. Uh, the reason why we're here in front of the zoning board is really not because of the tower but because of a, I've actually never seen it, a, an odd provision in your zoning bylaw that says that um, um, permitted uses that use an access driveway over another parcel, that the, the driveway needs to be on a parcel that's also 
for that permitted use. Uh, the, the cell tower itself will be located on a parcel that is within your wireless overlay district. So it's a permitted use subject to a special permit from the planning board. But because the adjacent parcel over which we're just driving over pretty much an existing driveway uh, is not in the wireless overlay district, your zoning bylaw requires me to come into the zoning board for a variance. So we might be able to dismiss that rather summarily, but uh, because uh, uh, there's also another provision in your zoning bylaw that was confusing to me, confusing to your building inspector actually, and, uh, um, th and I think what happened is your zoning bylaw has evolved. It was cobbled together with several other model bylaws, and there was some confusion as the type of structure that we're permitted to build. Uh, we are building what's called a lattice style tower, and I'll get into more detail about that. Uh, and there are provisions of your zoning bylaw that say a lattice style tower is permitted, period. Uh, there's other provisions that say you need to be a monopole style, which is a different style of tower, and we'll get into the, the pros and cons of each. Um, and, um, and there's also a provision in there that says the planning board can waive that, but it was kind of convoluted, and I, because I had to apply to the zoning board anyways for that driveway variance, I threw in a variance request for this, and at some point, either the planning board's going to say, we can waive it, the zoning board's going to say, we can bury it, or none of the above, um, if they were so inclined. But uh, uh, I, I just didn't know the proper procedure, uh, given the the, uh, um, the complexity of your zoning bylaw and, I guess, the novelty of this application. Um, by way of introduction, Vertex Towers is what we call a wireless infrastructure developer. We are not a telecommunications company. What's happened, for the most part, is that the names you've heard of before, like AT&T and Verizon and T-Mobile, have gotten out of the real estate business to focus on telecommunication services and have partnered up with folks like Vertex to build wireless infrastructure. And we find it's actually uh, a win-win for a lot of different reasons. It allows um, companies like Vertex to come into a town like Hubbardston where there, there's a truly a need. I don't think we can all debate whether there's a need for better telecommunications, but given the population, the traffic flows, you know, people have been focused on Worcester and Boston and the major metropolitan areas, and Vertex has come up with a model to come out to more rural Massachusetts very successfully. We can also, as a real estate developer, we look at your zoning bylaw very carefully. We pick sites that are as compliant with your zoning bylaw as possible. Um, we uh, look at sites that we build them, they're called co-locatable facilities. It's basically a vertical structure, like a vertical strip mall that we lease space to multiple telecommunications companies. And we design it with the foresight, the height, the structural integrity to uh, uh, attract multiple telecommunications companies. And so it's a a win-win for a town like Hubbardston that truly needs better telecommunication purposes. And we've been very active in the rural uh, Massachusetts, rural New Hampshire market. We've also done a lot of work in um, suburban Massachusetts as well. We just built a tower in Shutesbury, not too far from here. We just built a tower in Coleraine. We built a tower in Monterey. Um, we've got approvals in probably half a dozen towns, Conway, Mass, Ashfield, Mass. Um, and then We've built uh, lots of similar sites in equally rural areas of New Hampshire, Vermont, and Maine. Uh, so it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a model that works, and we've been very well received based on this. Um, I submitted to the uh, both boards pretty much everything, even though 90% of the application was not applicable to the zoning board. I gave the zoning board everything that I gave the planning board because it was just easier to file one application rather than piece things out. Uh, your town's consultant reviewed it. Uh, noted a few deficiencies, so we've updated the application with um, um, with uh, certain uh, deficiencies that your town consultant noticed. Uh, we uh, um, one of the things that we did as well is that uh, um, in previous consultation with the planning board, we uh, were required to do drainage calculations, and that required some minor tweaks to the plan. So we've updated the site plans. I think from uh, most everyone's perspective, you're not going to notice a difference other than the, the town's engineer that uh, um, required some uh, uh, drainage mitigation. Uh, we also, um, as required by your zoning bylaw, we uh, did a visual demonstration, a visibility demonstration where we put a balloon up in the air. 
we advertised it. The other thing that was incredibly unusual about your zoning by law, I've never done it before, and I think I've done more than dozens of these sites, is that it required us to send notice to everybody in town, whether they're, you know, um, we put an ad in the paper, we, uh, um, we sent a notice to everybody in town so that people knew that the balloon was up and could see it, and more importantly, not see it. Because I think, as we saw during the visibility analysis, and we'll get into that in more detail, um, you know, it really, you know, even though we're building a 150 foot tall structure, which people think, oh my God, you're going to see that all over town, it's really not that visible given the location, given the setbacks, given the visual buffer, given everything else that we uh, were required to do. I also submitted uh, very extensive drainage calcs. I understand drainage is a big concern in this town. We've learned that as we've gone through the process with the planning board and speaking with the town's engineer. And uh, so uh, even though we have the type of facility that we build, it's really um, de minimis construction. We're basically building a 60 by 60, 3,600 square foot compound in the middle of a 13 acre parcel uh, uh, with an access driveway that, that flows onto Brigham Street. But given the existing condition of Brigham Street, um, um, we did very extensive drainage calculations, which I submitted to the town as well, to show that we don't have any impact on drainage. It's really, we're not really creating any new impervious surface other than um, um, a small foundation for the tower itself. So um, it, it really doesn't have any impact on drainage, but I, I we certainly recognize the town's concerns in that regard. Um, I, so I also submitted a very large package with a very extensive application and all the, uh, I went through your zoning bylaw with respect to telecommunications facilities very carefully and uh, uh, went through every line. This, we meet this, we meet this, we don't meet this, we need a variance, we meet this, we meet this. And quite um, successfully, we were able to design a facility that really meets your bylaw in all respects with the exception of the, the variance and the waiver that we're seeking. Um, I don't know that I need to sell telecommunications here in Hubbard Center, the need for better telecommunications. Uh, I've spent some time here. Um, uh, um, we got locked out of the building and someone said, well, let's just call the building person that's got the code and then you couldn't get a cell phone signal. I sat outside, uh, I got here about half an hour early and I sat outside and usually I just stare at my phone and um, try to get some uh, work done. And you know, there's no signal here. And I think, um, um, you know, the, and the statistics driving the need for better telecommunications are staggering. Over 50% of the households in Massachusetts have cut the landline and are using wireless telecommunications as their only source of telecommunications. More than 70%, and that's an old statistic, I think we're over 75% of 911 calls are made by mobile phones. Um, did anyone have their phone buzz today? Um, yes. I was in um, Leminster sitting at the Staples making photocopies and the whole world started blowing up because there was a storm warning. And I don't know that everybody in Hubbardston got that notice because of the lack of telecommunications. Uh, so it, it's really something that, uh, you know, and, and um, there's all kinds of um, other public safety um, urgencies. And what's happened over the last two years is people have tried to work from home, educate from home, and just the, the need for better telecommunications is becoming um, even more dramatic. Um, there's actually a lot of uh, studies showing that the lack of telecommunications is becoming a public safety hazard. We do a lot of work in a lot of rural counties in New Hampshire that are strongly encouraging us to come there to build infrastructure networks because of the just the, the, the need uh, for better telecommunications from a public safety perspective. Um, and uh, um, why here? Why on Main Street? Uh, um, your zoning bylaw says to go here. Uh, um, your zoning bylaw has very uh, it's got what's called a wireless overlay district, a wireless communications overlay district. It denotes one zoning district, the town center district, it, and a couple of random lots around town um, that are scattered around town. Um, um, and it also has very extensive setback requirements. So when you look at the town center district, which we're here right now, um, there was only one or two lots in the whole uh, zoning district that could support a structure of height and meet the, what we call, tower height setback requirements. Your, your zoning bylaw requires us to be tower height away from property lines. So if you can imagine, you need a lot that's, when well, we're proposing a tower that's 150 feet, 300 feet wide um, at a minimum. And uh, um, there was only one or two lots. And then the other issue that we had is wetlands. Uh, so uh, we were able to look at all the lots in the wireless overlay district, rule out 90% of them just based on the lack of size. And uh, 
Um, and then we also have to get uh, find a lot that's buildable, that we can access it. In this particular case, we actually found a lot that uh, uh, we could build the facility, but we couldn't get access because between Mar Main Street and um, the, 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 the height that we need to get to it and get a setback off of Main Street to read all the required setbacks, we would have to have gone through wetlands, which is another um, zoning concern that we try to avoid. So we were able to secure access over two abutting lots going to, to Brigham Street and, but, and, and to avoid the wetlands and avoid any impact on, on wetlands. Um, the, uh, unfortunately, I have a great presentation that would have been right up there. I don't know if the uh, 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 folks at home can see this, but uh, um, you should be able to share it. Um, mm -hmm. You're made a panelist, so you should be able to share it to the Zoom. Let me just do that so at least folks know. Host disabled participant sharing, so you have to. Um, somehow it's disabled. Oh, I'm sorry, it's probably settings. So can the folks at home, can they see my um, my maps right now? They can. Okay. Um, unfortunately, the folks here can't. But, uh, um, and th this, well, I'm just referring to information that was all in the original package. Um, we, we did substantial um, analysis to show where the existing infrastructure is in town. And as you know, there's no cell towers in Hubbardston. Um, uh, there's some existing towers along the Route 2 corridor in Gardner and Westminster that have a little bit of impact to the north uh, eastern parts of of um, uh, Hubbardston. There's a tower in Rutland that has some impact to the east, a tower in Barrie that has some impact to the south southwest. But for the most part, you know, the, the center of Hubbardston is where there's the, 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 the great lack of telecommunications from existing infrastructure. Um, 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 to the large format okay. paper copies and plans. Um, and we submitted several um, maps showing where this existing coverage comes from. It comes from the abutting tower. But it, 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 it was, as was clear, like what I would say, the center of Hubbardston, the area that we're in right now, um, the, the corridor that goes north up towards Gardner, and then the east-west uh, going towards Barrie and uh, west towards Princeton and Rutland, that, that's where the, the, the severe um, lack of telecommunications signal is. Um, the facility itself is a large, it's a 13 acre undeveloped, so I'd say it's substantially undeveloped. There's a house that has some frontage on, on um, um, uh, that has, uh, there's a house lot on the front of the property down by uh, Mr. Chairman, Main Street. I have an easel and a board that we could mount some of the hard copies to. Would you like to get that? Uh, yeah. Uh, that benefit. We can, or um, uh, I actually have copies as well. Uh, if you want to just circulate them. Unfortunately, the presentation doesn't follow. I don't go to the site plans. I talked about all the maps, all that. So, it, I, I mean, I have everything here. If people want to share it, uh, let me just go to the yeah. car real quick. Yeah, I think that'd be helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Bill.
I'm used to being so electronic that uh, uh, when the electronics don't work. Let's do this here. If you don't mind, I'll just no, open this up for now. Up. That's fine. I'll just open this up uh, now because I think people really would like to see that map. Exactly. It's the one that shows yep. the existing zones. Yeah. And then the one next to it is quite good. It shows exactly. the yellow and green. This one, right? This is green? That's correct, yes. And then the, uh, yeah, there's like three in a row. Um, right, so why don't we do this here? Why don't we give this here to the gentleman to the right? And keep this one here. If there's anybody from the. Uh, would you like to maybe pass this along? And then you can share this here. So, so thank you very much. A three map showing where the tower would cover, where it's dead, and what the, the outlying towers and the new tower would cover together, which is yeah. pretty much the whole town. I think it was online at a meeting. Yes, it was online. It was, yes. So you might so just pass it along so that people have, uh, the, the folks who are here have reference. Give you a good understanding of the coverage. I think if you would be so kind, maybe pass it to people on the side here. That way. Information is powerful, so I think it's important. Thank you. Currently covered. This is their link that we have to do. Yeah, this is a series of pictures. They were online. Long time. All right. <laughs> <laughs> He's a magician. You're the owner of that. Oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 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 Big roll. Uh, I believe Mr. Parisi also had. I have lots of small copies. I don't have any copies. Yeah, I don't have any copies. Yeah. Yeah. circulating now are the coverage maps showing the existing coverage, the yellow representing um, somewhat reliable coverage uh, in the town of Hubbardston and the white representing where there's less than reliable coverage. And that's not saying you can't get coverage in certain places, but you know, what we're trying to provide is a reliable signal that we can guarantee that you get a signal not only in your car or walking outside, but in a building. And as you can imagine, a dense building like the school next door, or the town hall, uh, requires a much stronger signal to penetrate the structure, as well as all the residential structures along Main Street and in the uh, uh, residential portions of Hubbardston. And then what the second map represents is what this tower is going to, what we anticipate with software analysis, to show what this tower will cover. It doesn't cover all of Hubbardston. These aren't very high-powered facilities. It's really a, a low-powered facility. And the reason is it's a two-way communication. Your phone needs to talk to 
the cell tower, and the cell tower needs to talk to your phone. And when you talk like this, you don't want this to be a high-powered um, signal. But what happens is, when you're in a town like Hubbardston, where there, the signal is so far away, you get, you're picking up rogue signals out of Gardner, this phone actually has to work harder. So if you want this phone to work more safely, you want to bring the telecommunications infrastructure closer to this phone. Uh, and then the third map we provided is the overlay, the overlay of the existing coverage plus the new coverage that we will get from this uh, this new facility. And it, it, like I said, it doesn't cover every portion of Hubbardston, but it certainly covers the majority of it. It covers the uh, um, the downtown area, this area that we're in now, the school, the uh, um, the few commercial buildings, and uh, the, the 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 residential neighborhoods surrounding it. The facility itself, like we said, is on 14 Main Street. It's a, uh, uh, 14 Main Street fronts on Main Street, but goes back um, about uh, maybe 1,500 feet. We're about uh, over 1,200 feet off of Main Street, set way back off of Main Street back there. Uh, 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 the driveway will come from the facility to um, 9 Main Street and then has a small uh, intersect with 7 Main, I'm not sorry, Brigham Street. Uh, the existing driveway, we're actually not creating a new driveway. There's an existing curb cut and an existing driveway to access 9 Brigham Street that we'll be utilizing. And then um, there's a, a, a farm field that we'll be kind of just laying some gravel down to facilitate some trucks going in. The access driveway is really designed for about a week's worth of activity. Uh, during the construction process, we bring in concrete for a foundation, we bring in components of the tower on a flatbed truck, um, and there's a fair amount of construction activity for about a month. And then once the facility is built, it's completely unmanned. There's no, um, someone might come by once a month to check on it to make sure the fence is still intact. All the electronics are remotely monitored. Uh, uh, um, so there's really no need for water or sewer or any um, uh, sanitary things that they'll set up temporary things during the construction process. The, the facility itself, like I said, is 60 by 60. Um, it's set back amply. It's kind of sort of in the middle of the property, so it's set back more than 150 feet from all the abutting properties to the north, west, and east, uh, north, east, and south. Uh, and uh, I think it's, it's designed in accordance with your bylaw as much as possible. We did a site visit with the planning board. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, and you know, it's a, it's a very densely forested area. The lot next to it is is farmed, uh, but the, the subject lot is densely forested, and it's also um, there's a lot of wetlands on it, which precludes any other development on the property. Uh, the compound itself is really just a fenced-in compound. It's like uh, 50 by 50. We cleared about 75 by 75 around it for uh, um, construction purposes, but the fence it's just a fenced-in compound in the middle of the woods that'll uh, house the telecommunications tower and some small um, telecommunications uh, cabinets. Um, what's happened in the telecommunications world is that a lot of the electronics are being shifted to the antennas, and so the cabinets at the base are getting much smaller. We used to build kind of big shelters that had uh, heating and cooling systems that generate a little bit of noise, but over time it's actually migrated to more like refrigerator size cabinets that have maybe a small cooling fan about the same size fan as your, your desktop computer. So it doesn't generate any noise, there's no smoke, there's no odor, there's no lights. The other thing too is that um, we try very hard to design facilities that don't require FAA lighting. Um, one, because people object to that more than anything else, and two, it's kind of a pain to change the light bulb, and we don't like to do that. <laughs> uh, so, and, it, and it, it's actually more, it's a big liability purpose. Once you put a light on it, you have to maintain the lighting because it, it gets denoted in all the uh, uh, air navigation maps, and so we just don't like that responsibility. And so we make sure that this facility at this location does not require an FAA lighting. And there's, because it's an unmanned facility, there's no lighting at the base of the facility. If anyone had to come there in the night, they'd bring temporary lighting in. Um, the, the, um, the, the facilities are not generally visited in the wintertime. We don't plow the access road. Uh, the existing driveway off of Brigham Street is utilized by the homeowner at 9 Brigham. I'm sure he plows his or maintains his driveway uh, as he does regularly. But what the, the exclusive area that goes across his uh, hay field and then into the uh, subject property uh, you know, won't, won't be uh, plowed at all. If someone needs to go there, 
during the winter time they'll bring some sort of snow access device. So it's very passive in nature and it doesn't really generate any kind of commercial activity, any kind of traffic, any noise, smoke, odors, things like that. The tower itself is what we call a lattice style. It's basically a giant erector set on which different yeah. telecommunications companies will um, um, mount different telecommunications antennas. Uh, they all mount them at different heights along the tower, generally about 10 foot separation, and that's to avoid any kind of radio interference with each other. Um, these facilities are very heavily regulated so that the uh, frequencies that uh, Verizon or AT&T utilizes are very heavily regulated, both in the respect of the frequency that they operate at and the power that they generate from it. And uh, so, but it, it's all designed so they don't interfere with each other. Uh, we've already um, uh, gotten commitments from AT&T. We're, we're in the process of talking to Verizon and T-Mobile. And we design it with the height and the structural integrity to make sure that we have uh, the, uh, to support multiple telecommunications companies, all of which we are deploying multiple telecommunications technologies. And for that, you heard there's a whole big technology evolution going on. And, uh, um, and this type of facility facilitates both uh, supporting today's technology, but also tomorrow's technology. Because it's made up of various different components, it's actually really easy to structurally enhance. If we underestimate in 10 years from now, we design something that's not structurally supportive of future technologies, it's really easy to uh, structurally enhance this type of facility mm -hmm. by just swapping out a few of the individual components in order to make it more structurally accommodating. So we find that it's actually um, a very um, um, flexible and uh, um, you know, it, it satisfies all the other requirements of your bylaw to make sure that we um, uh, accommodate co-location, that we design it for multiple telecommunications companies. Um, the, um, the driveway itself, like I said, uh, there's an existing curb cut off of 9 Brigham. Unfortunately, it crosses over a little bit of 7 Brigham. I don't think anyone realized that until our surveyors went out there. Uh, and then there's an existing driveway that goes maybe uh, 50 or 75 feet into the property. And then this is all a farm field here, a hay field, that we'll be just be crossing in the middle of the field. The, the, the farmer actually drives over it now. We'll probably improve it with a little bit of gravel just to make it um, um, passable for the, the, the maintenance and the, the construction trucks. And then over here at the borderline of the facility, there's an existing stone wall that we'll be um, just dismantling about 12 feet of in order to go into the property. So this this is really the only really new construction that we're generating. It's probably, it's a, I think we saw like 200, uh, 175 feet. So maybe 175 feet of road and then to the, the compound itself. Um, so, uh, you know, from a, a construction perspective, it's really good. Does it show Main Street on the top of the map? Uh, so you can like show the whole lot. Way down here at the top. Okay, okay. Uh, unfortunately, this is a. Uh, um, it's all right. Th this will help. Main Street's down here. We're set, even though the project fronts on Main Street, we're about 1,500 feet, I mean 1,200 feet off of Main Street, so going straight back. Street, uh, back. Um, so it, it's a. Um, the, the, the lot is a. Um, it's it's pretty much a rectangle that comes off of Main Street. Um, um, so and, and like I said, we'll be 1,200 feet off of, of uh, Main Street, and uh, you know, over a thousand feet from all the residential structures um, that have already exist on Main Street, and more than tower height setback, 172 feet from this property, uh, 212 from this property, and uh, uh, 225 from that property. Both of uh, these properties on these sides, we've already secured. Um, uh, uh, the, the right to cross over the building. That looks pretty close to it. <laughs> <laughs> the, the rest of the site plans, we can talk about it in more detail, but um, our engineers are very adept at making sure that the, the, there's no stormwater runoff, that we, see, we have sufficient erosion control in the drawings. So there's a lot of detail that I'm sure the engineer gets all excited about, but uh, 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 you know, and we can talk about it. If necessary. Um, the other thing, I don't know how we're going to do this. Uh, the, 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 the biggest thing is people, what's it going to look like? Um, as required by your zoning bylaw, we put a, uh, a balloon up in the air, we advertise it, we sent notice to everybody in town, which was a huge chore because we've never actually done that before, but it actually worked. Uh, uh, and, um, and then we took photographs of the balloon at various vantage points where it can be seen and more importantly where it can't be seen. And then for the photographs that we, there was some visibility we can actually do with Photoshop, photo simulation showing what the tower is going to look like. 
Um, I have several copies here. Yeah, if possible, can you walk down the list and yeah. then we'll just circulate the pictures around the room? How many paper copies do you have of the pictures? Cool. Well, that's plenty to circulate on. I'm going to throw a bunch here on the table. I guess maybe just, we'll send a couple of the actual. You're going to send them around the group? Oh, I do whatever you want me to do. I'm here. Yeah. Okay. Just uh, send use a couple me. of packets around. Okay. All right. Thanks, Evan. So we're going to pass it that way. Yeah. If you can that share, way. you've got about enough. You can pass it out. Going that way, and this one, the passing, which is the same one this one is, right? It has the, yeah, no the target with where they were taken based on Bill's map. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, a little picture part of your presentation. Yeah, I have the folks at home can see it. Unfortunately, you can't see it there, so we'll just kind of do it. Tell them how it was conduct it. That's where we do 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 it. Pardon me, is there anyone who would be interested in this does, does anybody else need a copy of the pictures? Okay. So we're resuming, so please hold the conversation. <coughs> we're resuming, please hold the conversation. Ladies and gentlemen, please. Mm -hmm. All right, what I'm, we do I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt here. During the meeting, we've asked that everybody please remain silent unless we are giving you the opportunity to speak. At this point in time, it's really for the board to have a conversation. Thank you so much. Um, what we do for the visit Italy demonstration is we hire consultants that do this um, full time. Um, they put a balloon up in the air. It's a red. Um, maybe a three to four foot uh, weather type balloon that uh, um, the, the string itself we can measure. So the string is 150 feet tall. The balloon is a little, actually a little higher than 150 feet, but that way when they do the photo simulations, they can accurately do the simulations as well. Um, I had um, um, had several communications with the planning department and, uh, and the town's uh, engineering consultant and the town's engineering consultant actually generated a list um, of vantage points. Uh, to be fair to him, actually, to be honest, I thought he was picking random spots, but as we looked at it, they were actually very thoughtful spots. There were places where there were either vistas that it might be visible or high points in town. Um, so even though we thought it was kind of like, over here, go over there, they were actually incredibly thoughtful parts. And, uh, um, and, uh, uh, but I think as we found a lot of the places where there might have been some visibility based on just vistas or vantage points, there really wasn't. And, uh, um, and uh, um, you know, we took several pictures along Main Street, which was the, uh, uh, the closest place. Uh, what, um, what they then do is uh, produce um, photo simulations. Uh, so we submitted uh, this whole package. Unfortunately, the camera is geocoded, so it's done based on not logic or the way people would drive, but the, the closest um, vantage points to the tower. So photo location one is right at, uh, this is the entrance to the driveway. And um, and as you can see, the balloon was invisible given a, a stand of existing trees here. And, and even though we did this in early June when the leaves are on the trees, you can see that a lot of the trees in this area are evergreen. And even if they're not evergreen, the, uh, the foliage is so dense but even with the leaves off the trees, you're not, it's not going to change the visibility during the, uh, the, uh, the winter months. Um, this was taken from uh, Main Street, and this was really uh, 
photo location number two. This was really the vantage point uh, uh, right in between, I think it's 10 and 12, uh, um, that there was some visibility of the tower. And then we superimposed, so page three, or page five is what's showing what the tower looked like. And as I drove up and down Main Street, there was really no other vantage point. You couldn't see it from over the, uh, um, uh, the post office. You couldn't see it from in front of 14 Street. Uh, 14 and then going down towards the market in that area. So this was really the only vantage point on Main Street where you got um, some visibility of the facility. Um, they're taken at the corner of Main Street and Brigham Street where the, uh, uh, the War Memorial is. There was no visibility. Um, and then there was just pictures taken, Williamville Road. And I'm going to jump back to the um, uh, map so I can see it. Um, the, the intersection up by uh, where uh, Main Street uh, splits. Um, no visibility, and and and, uh, uh, and yeah, as you imagine, that's a pretty um, wide vista because you've got the uh, merger of two different streets and some lots that have already been cleared of trees and with no visibility there. Uh, um, there was a little bit of visibility from the park up that Gardner Road. Um, 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 Uh, yeah, from the park at Gardner Road, a little bit of visibility, um, um, uh, but you know, for the most part, it's just projecting. And when you say you're building a 150-foot structure, you're really not seeing 150 feet. You're really seeing the top 20 to 30 feet of the facility. Uh, so even though it projects substantially above the trees at the location, it really doesn't when you start stretching back from various vantage points. Uh, 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 then uh, the only other place there was some visibility in town. I'll just skip to that photo. It was down to, um, at the, I don't know what you call it, where all the uh, fishing boats go out on the pond just south of downtown here. Evergreen. Uh, Brigham. Uh, yeah, not Brigham Road. It's uh, Wilkinson Road. Um, yeah. um, Do you have the photographs number? Uh, photo 12. Um, so the is Old Princeton Road. Right. Yeah, Old Princeton Road. Exactly. Um, from the dam and the bridge that goes over the uh, um, pond, you didn't see it, but basically where the boat launch is, I, I, uh, um, sometimes when I come to town early, I sit down there and uh, I, I see fishing boats out there all the time, and, and where the boat launch is, it just kind of sort of projects above the trees um, minimally, but the, you know, and I think so for the most part, other than a few spots in town, I think we picked a location that um, you know, maximizes the uh, 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 telecommunication signal and minimizes the visibility of the facility, which I think is what your bylaw uh, provides. Um, the rest of the package just has lots of places around town. You can look at the map where um, um, there was no visibility. And like I said, a lot of these locations were chosen by the town's engineering consultant based on um, topography or vistas or things like that, certain farms that the uh, um, look in that direction, but given the existing vegetation, uh, you know, I think we uh, picked a location that really uh, minimizes the visibility and maximizes the telecommunication signal. Uh, and I can go through all these, but there's, like I said, a lot of photos that's not visible, not visible, not visible. Uh, uh, and and uh, there's several vantage points that had some higher elevations, uh, Malone Road, Hale Road, uh, 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 way out on Hubbardson Road. So I think, uh, like I said, the, uh, uh, notwithstanding um, the height of the facility, I think it's of minimal visibility. The other thing I, I failed to mention when we were talking about the signal is, uh, like I said, these are very low-powered type facilities. They're not designed to cover all of Western Massachusetts. Um, they routinely broadcast out about at about 100 watts. Um, and like I said, that's because it's a two-way signal. Um, by comparison, um, I suspect that you can get WBZ AM radio here in parts of Hubbardston. That broadcasts out at 50,000 watts, and that's designed to cover as wide an area. AM, FM radio has tried to cover as wide an area as possible. This is quite the opposite. This type of technology is only, to, only uh, designed to cover uh, a few square miles, and that's a very amorphous term because it's based on topography and terrain. But it's really only designed to cover uh, you know, a short distance to the north and the southeast and the west uh, to get and to get above the topography and terrain 
um, without you know blasting all over uh, uh, Western Massachusetts. Um, I'm sure you all read it. I, I submitted a very extensive memorandum going through all the provisions of your zoning bylaw, the requirements for a uh, um, uh, special permit. Um, uh, and I think, you know, with the exception of the one variance which we need, which actually isn't a variance from the zoning bylaw, I mean, the wireless bylaw, it's a variance for your zoning bylaw. Uh, and also the either variance or waiver for the type of structure. We've designed a facility that's completely compliant with your zoning bylaw. Uh, um, I said I went through all of the requirements for a variance um, and how we need it. Uh, I'm sure the zoning board has all read it. Uh, but you know, I think they know we need to show that due to uh, unique circumstances, due to soil, scape, topography, that there's a hardship that is created by a little enforcement of the bylaw, um, and and that relief can be granted without detriment to the public good. Um, in this particular case, the hardship is defined by both the topography and your zoning bylaw. Your zoning bylaw said we can only go in very specific locations. And we were able to find a location that was satisfactory, mm -hmm. but for access to the facility, which would have required us to go through wetlands. So right. we're just driving over an adjacent parcel, which isn't in the um, overlay district. It doesn't quite make sense to me why that even exists, because all we're doing is creating a driveway, which would have been permitted um, if we weren't building a telecommunications facility. Uh, so uh, you know, uh, we could build the driveway now without any uh, permission or oversight, but because we're building driveway to the telecommunications facility, we require to be in the same zoning district and, uh, and therefore seek the variance. Uh, I also um, um, want to make mention the federal government is very supportive of wireless infrastructure development. Um, back about 20 or actually 25 years ago now, they created a very extensive umbrella uh, uh, a statute called the Telecommunications Act of 1996. And it was done in conjunction when they broke up AT&T into multiple telecommunications companies. And they licensed multiple wireless companies in order to foster more competition in the telecommunications industry. And, and we still have um, um, four very active uh, telecommunications providers here in this market. Uh, and that expands and contracts. There's always mention about Google or Amazon developing their own wireless network, but uh, um, and the government is very committed to uh, facilitating the development of infrastructure by um, um, there's some overriding law that, and I don't want to say it says you have to say yes, but what it does say is you can't say no without substantial reason. Uh, and in this particular case, the town has heavily regulated federal uh, telecommunication facilities, and we meet the bylaw. We're in the we're in the zoning district that the, the town has uh, um, said we need to be in. Uh, uh, and what the town can't do is have regulation or um, um, board uh, 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 discretion that has the effect of prohibiting telecommunications. Uh, and by Having such extensive bylaws with setback requirements, having all the other requirements of your zoning bylaw to avoid wetlands and to be in a particular zoning district, um, you know, we believe we have found a facility that is compliant, but that denial would be a, a prohibition because it really nowhere else to go with all of the other limitations and requirements of your zoning bylaw. So we would ask that the planning board grant the special permit, that the zoning board grant the variance for the driveway. We could talk about the type of structure because I think that's either variable by the zoning board or waivable by the uh, planning board. And uh, um, and the other thing I'll also tell you is that uh, um, these facilities, in addition to having several um, benefits under federal law, we also have a lot of requirements under federal law. Um, we we have very extensive oversight by the federal government. Um, for a, a, a whole host of environmental impacts. Uh, because these uh, facilities are federally regulated, they're also uh, required to comply with a very comprehensive uh, federal law called the National Environmental Policy Act, uh, NEPA. And uh, what it requires us to do is to make sure we don't have any impact on um, 
endangered fish and wildlife species, endangered plant species, uh, any um, Native American resources, any other historic resources that we don't have any impact on uh, uh, wetlands or anything like that. So it's a very extensive analysis that uh, we have uh, made sure that we don't comply with, but we're not finished yet because it requires us to do a lot. Of, like we have to reach out to like 30 different Indian tribes. Uh, and inevitably some tribe out of Oklahoma says, yeah, we were there once 300 years ago, 500 years ago, and requires us to do some more due diligence in that regard. And that process takes time. So we're in the middle of that, we're confident that uh, it's not going to trigger any kind of uh, extended study in that regard, but uh, realize that even if you were to prove it here, we're still months and months away from completing all the other due diligence. The other thing, too, is that uh, we haven't designed the foundation yet. We actually can't get to the site except for walking. But eventually, we'll bring a geotechnical rig out there uh, that can drill down and do a very thorough analysis of the underground soil conditions. And then we design a foundation that's very specific <coughs> to the location, very specific to the, uh, 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 the height of the facility, the type of facility. And then we'll submit all that data to the building inspector with the, um, the building permit. But realize that takes time as well. So we're, we're not building tomorrow, but uh, um, we'd like to get this done as quickly as well. Our goal is to get it done by the end of the year, because uh, it's really hard to do, build these type of facilities in the wintertime, uh, and uh, especially with the amount of snow that we get out in this region here. So uh, our goal is to get it uh, uh, permitted within the next several weeks so we can finish the federal due diligence and then get it constructed before the end of the year. So with that, I would request that the zoning board grant the special permit. Does the planning no the planning board grant the special permit? The zoning board grant the variance. And uh, uh, I, I have Tom Johnson on the Zoom line with us. If you have any technical questions with respect to the civil engineering, and uh, hopefully I can answer all your other questions. Well, thank you for your thorough presentation. Uh, before we move on to the boards, I wanted to see if Mr. Murray had any technical questions. Do you have any questions at this time? Not technical, no. Any other questions at this time? Well, administrative. Okay. Um, I don't believe that the proposal that we gave for the secondary review was forwarded to Mr. Parisi, and I don't believe you received those funds. So while we have initiated the second technical review, the funds aren't in the, in the account yet. It's his fee to do the final review, and he has quoted that to us. And you apparently didn't get a copy. I can send it to you. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not adverse to paying it, as long as it's reasonable. I haven't seen it yet. Um, I question the need for it. And um, we um, somewhere, um, submitted a... Um, um, A 90 page analysis showing that we have de minimis uh, increase in impervious surface and de minimis um, um, you know, impact on stormwater runoff that we were very easily able to um, address with some minor revisions to the site plans. So, um, um, and I think having walked the site, um, um, I think the planning board had the opportunity to see that. We're just in the middle of the woods. Uh, and, uh, uh, our engineers uh, took from the site walk and their conversation with Mr. Murray, the bigger concern is any drainage that comes off the site for onto Brigham Road because of the, the of Brigham Street, given the, uh, the already um, uh, significant um, deterioration of Brigham Street. And we were able to make sure we're not doing anything up against Brigham Street other than cleaning out some culverts to make sure that the existing stormwater runoff systems work. but. Uh, uh, um, we're, you know, we're basically driving over a, a, a hay field. So I ask whether or not the board actually needs any kind of extended review in that regard. Um, yes, Bill? So we did start the technical review, and I have three pages of comments, and we're not done. Yeah. I, um, I would suggest that we are an all-volunteer board, and we don't really have any professional staff at the moment. Bill is our version of professional staff. So we rely on them very heavily for making decisions. And historically, uh, it has been important for us for making decisions. And that's also where our proposed findings originate. 
uh, and those are necessary for putting together the special permit. So uh, I, I would suggest from a planning board perspective they are necessary. I don't know if anyone on the planning board has any different feelings on that. He, d he drafts the opinion <coughs> after we vote. It's a very pretty technical opinion. You know, it has the bonding, it has the provisions. So part of what he does in his review is gather the information to give you a recorded approval or to give the board a disapproval so you'd have something to appeal with. I mean, it's really an important part of the process for us. I, I understand. I, uh, uh, I'm, I can't agree summarily to a bill I haven't seen yet. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure it's reasonable. I'm sure you impose that on every applicant. We uh, did. Uh, so uh, uh, assuming I'm not being singled out in that regard. No. It, 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 this has been historically been, and there's plenty of precedents here. Perfect. Send it to him. <laughs> I mean, not precedents with regards to cell towers, but right. with yeah. other special permits. Um, yeah, this is one of the challenges we're facing, not having a, an admin at the moment. Um, we can email you the bill. Uh, we also have it on Allison's computer right here. Email would be perfect. I just forward along to bookkeepers. Just to remember um, the town adds an administrative fee to my. Oh. Whatever that is. And and as Chris and I have discussed, I don't know what that percentage is. Yeah, that's handled through uh, through Mallory, who's only on Monday nights, Monday and Tuesday nights at the car uh, well, We could still send this into all of the administrative yeah. meetings, I believe it. Um, send along, I understand your concerns, and I won't send it back until. Okay. Uh, Do we have questions, or do we want to? Uh, well, how do you want to proceed? Any here? more procedural or administrative questions? If not, no. we'll. Uh, questions. Well, can, can I ask one procedural question? Uh, one of the things I'd like to decide is we are proposing a lattice tower. There's a sentence that said lattice towers are permitted, and then there's other provisions that say they don't use the word lattice; they use monopole. Yes. And so, and then the provision that uses the word monopole says that it's waivable. And, but it's it's kind of convoluted, and so I uh, and uh, the uh, building inspector and I couldn't come up with a good answer. So um, one of the things I'd like to just resolve is that is it waivable or is it variable? And because uh, I, I I did both, and so I can if you the planning board says it's waivable and they were so inclined to waive it, and we can withdraw that variance request, or if the planning board says we can't waive it, then I'll just make sure that the zoning board addresses it. Uh, uh, Mr. Murray? <laughs> I agree that the planning board can waive it. Okay. And, and just to be clear, the monopole, uh, and this is just for the general audience, the monopole infrastructure that uh, we're talking about, it is my understanding from prior discussions, is one that does not have the longevity compared to a lattice pole, is that correct? Right. Um, and, and or the flexibility. Uh, um, um, a monopole is very, uh, it's engineered very specifically today. Once we engineer it, it has no um, ability to be modified in the future. And, um, and what we're finding that, you know, for a while, certainly in more visible locations, I know you're coming down Route 2, uh, where you've got the Route 2, um, you know, eight lanes of asphalt, you see some monopole type facilities. And, uh, um, but what we're finding is that uh, with the newer antennas, they're no longer structurally compatible. Okay. So we're either doing uh, uh, literally Mickey Mouse and Jerry Ray type situations or um, being forced to rebuild them. The lattice structure is just something that is um, more accommodating for today, tomorrow, and it's much easier um, 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 modified in the future because it's a whole series of components and they can uh, swap them out uh, um, very easily so so it, it just it's a uh, uh, it's a pun I use all the time it would be short-sighted to uh, use a monopole structure and would it be fair to say that the structure underneath to support a monopole versus a lattice would be also significantly different just yeah, because uh, of the way that it is actually being constructed and um, the weight the, that it has to the, um, um, the foundations are 
And I know you're not the engineer. Maybe your engineer no. can speak to that. The it's all very specific. Yeah. Um, sometimes um, the um, lattice tower is actually a less invasive foundation because they can do three pier type foundations. My point exactly. Right. Versus, versus one. Versus one big mat. Uh, but it's hard to say because sometimes we have to do a mat based on the soil conditions. Uh, my, my suspicion is is that um, there's some ledge up there, which right. would require us to do more pier type with drilling as opposed to a mat type foundation. Thank well, you. Seeing so how we're talking about foundations, it sounds like we've gone down the road to substantive, so I'd like to, to turn it over to the ZBA for questions. Okay. So, so let me just clarify, if you say that you can waive the requirement for the lattice tower, then I believe that the zoning board's only issue is whether or not um, I can use the adjacent lots for a driveway to a cell tower because uh, they are not in the wireless overlay district, uh, whereas the tower itself is in the wireless overlay district. So that's really the only variance. Or if the planning board doesn't waive, grant you the waiver, you can appeal to the zoning board of appeals. Yes, right. So. So I guess I'm not withdrawing, uh, you're right, I'm not withdrawing that until they make their decision, but uh, uh, assuming that the board, planning board grants the waiver, I would withdraw that marriage, of course. We can make a decision. Uh, do we want to have a discussion on that? A discussion, yes. Well, it's up to you, you're the chair. Uh, <laughs> let's, let's go forward with the, uh, the ZBA first. Yes. Okay. Questions from the ZBA? Yeah, I have two basic questions. The, the owners of 7 and 9 Brigham, are they here? Do you have something in writing from them? I, they're, they're in the application package. Okay, I didn't see it in mine. No, uh, um, uh, it is in here. It is in there? Okay. Uh, we, we have structured um, easements over their property and got letters of authorization from them, too. They, they, they're not really involved in this process. We're the applicant. They're just the landowners. But uh, we have structured uh, agreements with them uh, okay. to... Uh, um, um, to cross their line. So they were very much aware of that. Other questions? So um, I understand that you need to bring the road in from Brigham because you're otherwise crossing wetlands. Exactly. Um, you also mentioned that there's a handful of other parcels in town that um, are considered in the overlay district. Um, did you study those other parcels to, for coverage and, and ability to build on those? Yeah, uh, we looked at all the parcels in the, the, the town center district, mm -hmm. and uh, um, there were only three that had any size. Uh, one and, and all three of those were wet. If you can imagine, right behind the, the developed part of Main Street, post office, and all the existing houses going down towards the, uh, um, the market, um, there's a big wetlands that crosses uh, that crosses all the, ta the the sites there. So we actually looked at another parcel, one over from this, and, and uh, um, couldn't access the property because of wetlands. What about the other parcels in town? Did you look at any of the other parcels? We were really focused on the town center district because it really, um, the, the, if you can imagine, the hill that town center is, the hill that this property is on really becomes a topographical impediment. So if we go farther north, then we don't get the coverage to the south. If we go farther west, we don't get the coverage to the, uh, um, to the east. So we really focused on, and, and the real driving need here is the center of town and getting as much east, west, north, and south as we can. So we really focused on the town center district. Okay, thank you. Was the church directly across the street, right here in the town center, entertained as far as the availability or the accessibility to put a tower in their steeple? Um, no. And I will tell you that uh, I've been doing this for a long time, and that um, has been done in the past. Mm -hmm. The problem is is that there, uh, you might be able to get one or two carriers in there, but the church steeple across the street wasn't designed with telecommunications in mind. and. Uh, um, I, I did one in Worcester. There's the Baptist Church, um, right as you come out of Worcester going towards um, 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 Assumption College, right downtown, right by Worcester Polytech. And, right. and 
wonderful. Right at the corner. Right, right at the corner. It's beautiful. It, it, and it really came out nice. But the problem is, is that you can only get one telecommunications company in there. So other companies were forced to go on other, and fortunately for Worcester, other buildings in the uh, in the area. So it, it's really not um, a solution, like a long-term solution, because we didn't look at it because it wouldn't accommodate multiple telecommunications companies. Okay. So, uh, Does the planning board have a copy of the uh, overlay that he refers to <laughs> multiple times? Sorry, yeah. Yeah. Tower communication, please. Well, what we have is it, the bylaw says anywhere in the town center district, and then it lists specific other parcels by map okay. and, and parcel number that it would be allowed on. So what I could do is give you that list. Oh, you great. Could, That's right. You could go on access GIS. Oh, there. Point three three. Okay. There. Okay. And these are dispersed around the town. They're not. They're they're not clustered. They're they're really. I have no idea how they can. So was there any possibility of putting multiple? Is there, was there any possibility of putting, for example? And I don't know your business, but I'm curious. Now that you mentioned, you could put one there. Was there any possibility of looking at putting one in the library in their steeple? Um, so now you got two. Yeah, that's really not our model. The library would require um, um, the town's involvement, the church involvement. It's just it's something that is theoretically possible, but a practical. Um, impractical, okay. Right. Uh, a lot of times going up and down the Mass Turnpike, okay. Uh, years ago we were driving down and, and we thought we were seeing an aberration. And we were looking and all of a sudden we saw this tower. And it came out and it actually had branches that blended in with the scenery of the other trees. Okay? It looks like you're just putting up a director set. Correct. So you, there is no intention of somehow using any type of creative, constructive method to have it blend in with the surrounding tree line. I'll tell you, um, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Yeah. Um, uh, um, there's, um, and what, um, the Mass Pike is a great example. Um, behind the Charlton rest stop um, on the Mass Pike, there is literally a 150 foot Hi. Charlie Brown Christmas tree. Right. Uh, Charlie Brown. Uh, uh, it, 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 it's evolved in a bad way. Um, That's fair. Uh, there, there's actually a decent one on the Mass Pike eastbound in Western Mass. Okay. But, uh, but again, it's devolved. And, and, you know, um, it's never going to look like a, uh, a an artificial Christmas tree. It's uh, true. Um, and you know, attempts to hide it. I, I had one town um, said you can't put lipstick on a pig, and I took offense to that, calling my cell tower a pig. However, it was true. It you know, it's never going to look like a, a tree. It's going to look like a giant pipe cleaner. And the reason is is that uh, um, you know, like a, 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 a like an artificial Christmas tree. The branches taper out, um, you know, three feet maybe, and so they, they maintain themselves. The branches that we have to deploy may have to go 12 feet or 15 feet, and they can't. They start to sag, so um, they so they're very rigid, and they they, they don't taper. They just it, like I said, it, uh, um, it 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 never looks like a Christmas tree. It never looks like. But a it does blend in more with the surrounding area. From some vantage points, maybe, but. Uh, um, you know, I, I like I said, uh, I personally noticed them more. You're in the business. Right. You're right. Yeah, I was driving along, and I noticed it too. Uh, another thing that caught my eye, I apologize too, by the way. Nope. Uh, another thing that caught my eye, coincidentally, I happened to be coming up 68 the day you were doing the balloon test. And I had no idea that it was going to be done. I was unaware. I was surprised. I came in and talked to a few people here in the building. It seemed like I had a clear view of it, but the picture seemed to either make it smaller than what my eye told me it was. Are the pictures a reasonable representation of the height of that balloon? Absolutely. The, um, they they certify it. They've been uh, scrutinized by many different cities and towns. Uh, we use them. I don't tell them where to go. I oh, yeah. I, yeah. I, uh, I asked for the town's input, and I just forwarded the list to them. Um, and it's not designed to be a, um, a depiction of every square inch where it's visible, but just a representative yeah. uh, visibility. And uh, 
but they certify it. The camera that they use is very sophisticated. It's designed to mimic the, the visibility of your eye. Because you with an iPhone now, you can zoom in and zoom in and zoom in. And, and this is, um, and um, we've actually gone back in a lot of towns and taken pictures of the actual from where we took the simulations, and it's uncanny how accurate they are. Okay. It, it, it's, it's something that they do very um, uh, um, responsibly and very uh, um, thoughtful. Okay. So none of these other areas were actually looked into as far as putting the tower in that were, were designated as areas for a tower, okay. it, whether they be further outside, at a higher elevation, et cetera. No, we, like I said, we were focused on the town. We, we actually looked at it kind of globally rather than uh, um, we really wanted to be in the town center, irrespective of the zoning bylaw, right. because this is the hill that kind of is the center point of town. So it, it allows us to provide, when you look at the coverage maps, it allows us to provide a signal, um, and, it, and it's very amorphous, but it allows us to provide a signal going south to connect up with the tower in Rutland and in north. Connect with the town of the mm -hmm. garden. So, and if we'd have, uh, um, you know, uh, even deviated a mile towards the, uh, you know, this hill, no, 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 that hill would have been the impediment to the other direction. So. Thank you very much for your time. I see a couple of spots um, in in your application for variance, and it it references that you're it's being designed to in accordance with the town's bylaws as much as possible and as much as possible as stated several several times what is it that's not in the zoning besides that what we've discussed is there anything else no not? Uh, um, like I said I, I probably wouldn't have come to the zoning board but for the provision in your zoning bylaw that says that a driveway has to be in the same zoning district as the use which I don't understand why. I've never seen that before in any other bylaw in Massachusetts, and I've done this in hundreds of towns. Um, so, uh, so that's the as much as possible. Um, and uh, um, and I had several meetings with the building inspector early on to see if we could avoid that. And and, and our engineers, you know, we could have driven off of of um, Main Street and pulled those through the wetlands and tried to get. Conservation Commission approval, which is uh, given your um, overall um, bylaws um, mandate to try to avoid wetlands and given the drainage and all the other watersheds, but we thought that was this was easier. So, uh, and from a construction standpoint, it's easier. We're driving over an existing driveway, driving over an existing hayfield to uh, to create a driveway that's only 200 feet long as opposed to 1,200 feet long through the wetlands. So it makes more sense from a construction perspective. It makes more sense from an environmental impact perspective. And, it, and like I said, I, I have asked the question several times, and no one's explained to me why that provision is there, um, and why um, even the, t the tower is in a permitted zone, but the driveway is not. And uh, there's nothing stopping me from building the driveway right now. Um, so. Um, the only so the the only other item that I had was <coughs> I, I agree with Al and I had a question on it. In your um, statement, it says that the, the monopole type or the um, lattice will be camouflaged to the greatest extent possible using artificial screening. Um, I, that might be a typo. Um, we look at it is by putting it in a lot that's heavily vegetated by meeting all the setback performance by being set back so far. You know, you, as you saw from the photo simulations, um, you're only seeing the top 20 or 30 feet of the tower, not 150 foot stock. And so camouflage is undefined, but uh, uh, we think that's um, a great form of camouflage. Uh, um, and in addition, this lot is wet, which precludes other development. So um, that those trees are gonna stay there. Uh, and we know the trees are gone on the adjacent parcel, it's a farm, but uh, um, so that's not going to change. Uh, but uh, I think for the most part, we can uh, um, utilize the existing vegetation as camouflage. Are you taking down any other trees? Nope. Just, just the like I said, it's like a 12-foot wide driveway um, from the hayfield to the site, and then 75 by 75 in the middle of the woods. Thank you. Yeah, one more. Two quick ones. I 
Uh, Center School has a clock tower. I'm assuming that based on our conversation, the uh, unfeasibility of using the library tower would apply to the clock tower at the Center School, um, which I is a newer building, probably structurally more <coughs> secure and sound. Um, I have never seen the clock tower, which tells me that it's probably not that tall. Uh, and um, so, uh, and one of the things that we do is design a facility to um, get above the trees and the pond <coughs> in order to um, provide a, a decent telecommunications. Okay. So, okay. And so, having never seen it, I can't imagine it's more than 30 foot. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned earlier on that you had spoken to the building inspector. Do you recall which one? Which <laughs> please? Um, I met him in Gardner. Roland. What, Roland, yes. Uh, James? I'm just guessing. That wasn't the building inspector. Yeah. Um, yeah, Roland, you're rolling, that's right. Okay, thank why, you. Why, why, do you, why do you ask? I, I was just curious, as to, there, there was some confusion as to the, the building inspector position, and I was just curious as to which one you were spoken to. <coughs> I, uh, I spoke early on to Mallory. Uh, she referred me to Roland. I met with Roland. I actually met with him in Gardner Town Hall. Right. We talked about uh, uh, Hubbardson business, and uh, uh, I will agree since that he really hasn't been that involved Mallory uh, up until a couple weeks ago was really quite helpful in this process but uh, I understand you've lost Mallory and so um, you guys get to slug on it by yourselves yeah Roland's no longer employed by us <laughs> really <laughs> <I've been laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, changes. Uh, any other questions no all right Yes. I have one comment. I just want to, on the driveway issue, <coughs> it, it does make sense in certain cases. If you had a business, you know, in our commercial zone, that had, like, a lot of trucks going in and out, say, so hardware supply business, you wouldn't want that drive, and it, and it, you know, had a guardrail in front of it, you wouldn't be able, want it to be able to put access through a neighborhood where you had 50 trucks going in and out of the day. It makes some sense. But here he's saying, like, two trucks a month and nothing in the winter, and, yeah, I'm just saying, it's not, like, nonsensical. Mm -hmm. It's just that when you think of waving it, you have to sort of think why it was ever there in the first place. Mm -hmm. And I think the zoning by law is trying to direct and encourage the construction to go through the frontage, which, I, you know, I agree with, you know, that that one statement is in, in that. Uh, but... I understand that. To to um, your point, to build through the frontage in this case, even if we could with the wetlands, would be going through a permitted zone, but a residentially used area. So, to your point, uh, and we're going to a place that it's agricultural, but there's probably some agricultural traffic because it's a pretty good sized farm. Uh, uh, that is already there, so we're not creating any other situation. And uh, um, and the landowners on both sides of the driveway have <coughs> consented to it. So. Additional questions from the planning board? Uh, a couple of questions. Uh, the tower, uh, the overall heights is more than 150 feet just because of the fact that you have a lightning rod, is that correct? Correct. Okay, so without the lightning rod, it is actually 149 feet, which is under the 150 feet maximum, correct? The, um, the foundation comes up about a foot, so it's 150 feet to the top. Um, and the, uh, okay. so, so it's, 150, it's 149 structure on a one foot foundation. So it comes up to 150, and then you, on top of that, you have a, what I would understand would be either six or seven foot Lightning rod, is that right. correct? It's just like a piece of rebar. It's about a. Uh, uh, that's that's yeah. fine. Yeah, exactly. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just saying yeah. is, is that uh, I don't know from a technical perspective if that violates or does not violate the, uh, the height requirement because it is part of the structure. And I just want to make sure that we, we, we make a note of this here. I do also understand, however, that mostly the height is made uh, clear from a visibility, for the visibility purposes. Right. And that a as you described it, the rebar is probably going to be not something that would be You'd never see it. made a distinction. Plus, it's the whole safety issue. Exactly. The reason I'm bringing this up is, is, is this height 
that you're currently proposing, is that a required height or can this be brought down so that including the lightning rod would meet the 150 feet? Um, we have designed it to be the minimum height necessary to provide a signal without exceeding your zoning level. Um, mm -hmm. If you ask the radio frequency engineers, they always say make it taller. If you ask the people like me, I say make it shorter because I'm the one that has to deal with you guys. And, um, and so there's always a lot of interplay in that regard. In addition, because it's a multi-carrier facility, we need to make sure that the lower heights on the tower are just as functional as the higher heights on the tower. I, I so, understood. So, so the, the, the question I guess I'm bringing here is, is the six foot difference is significant enough for you not to absolutely. want to uh, shorten the tower and make sure that you still have a lightning rod. Right, that's correct. I, 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 that's correct. We, we're trying to get as much height as possible and be compliant. So. Very good, thank you. Next question I have is, is uh, you say you do not need FFA, FAA light. Can you explain why that is? Because that is something that is new to um, me. Uh, in general, the rule of thumb is anything over 200 feet gets higher scrutiny. In general, <coughs> anything less than five miles from an airport gets scrutiny. And we, um, there's databases that we can look at to say, if we are right here at 150 feet, uh, does it require, does it have any impact on air navigation? And we submitted a report as part of the package that says, no, it doesn't. And so because it has no impact, it doesn't even require registration with the FAA. Got it. Um, but That's uh, fine. I, we, I was just we, curious. On we this routinely airplane. do. But it doesn't require us to light it. It just means that, um, and I'll tell you, like there, like there's towers in um, uh, Lemonster and Pittsburgh that are lit because there's a little municipal airport in Makes Pittsburgh, sense. I believe. Okay. This is just far enough away that it, it doesn't trigger anything. Perfect. Uh, it th does this tower require a utility hookup? Yes, we bring in power from Brigham Street along the driveway. To the facility. So let's not talk about Brigham Street or any other street. Then. So, in generally speaking, you would have to bring power into this location That's in correct. order to be able to make it functional. That's correct. And in making your assessment of the access, has the access of that utility into your tower had a significant impact as to where you have that access into? Uh, that facility, meaning if you had the access, if you were to do this access through Brigham Street versus if you had to do this here through a different location for all intents and purposes, Main Street, is there a significant difference and a, an impact to bringing the utility in? Because um, that is a permanent structure that you would have to create, is my understanding. Right, we'd bring in overhead lines from uh, um, the, um, the access driveway was designed uh, with the consultation of the landowner to make sure that uh, he was aware that we were bringing overhead lines in. And we're basically following an existing, I don't know what you call it, um, it's, it, we walked it. It's a road that he uses frequently to um, plow with hayfield. It's not a driveway, it's, uh, but it's like kind of a standard pathway. So he was happy with us following that existing pathway and bringing utilities along that. But did you do a similar evaluation if you had to bring utilities in from Main Street? No, because the, the, the wetlands were so extensive that we just said we can't come in from Main Street. And it would, yeah. and it would preclude you to bring utilities in from Main Street? Um, because of the fact that you're wetlands? I, 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 be honest, or was just not even considered any value? I, I believe uh, uh, Tom, Tom, Mr. Are you there? Johnson was looking to respond to that. Uh, yeah, thanks. I uh, just thought I'd like jump in there real quick. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, yes please right. identify yourself for the record. Sure. Uh, Tom Johnson. I'm the engineer uh, with Proterra Design. Uh, my firm is the one who prepared the plans. Um, actually, the, the latest set of plans here shows those utilities coming in underground. Um, it's a, a change that's happened since. Um, so the whole stretch will be run underground conduit from the, um, from the street out to the compound area. Did you say underground? Underground, yeah, Nobody will ever see it. Yeah. Okay. Anybody will be brought in from Brigham Street is what yes. you're saying? Yes. Yes, yeah, from Brigham Street and, and as um, 
as uh, Mr. has kind of indicated, we, it wouldn't be feasible to make that run from Main Street um, because of the, the kind of extensive wetland area between Main Street um, and as you start heading up the hill towards the tower site. So um, in, in addition, it makes sense to follow the access drive with the utility. Okay. And then the last question I have is you have mentioned two waivers thus far. I do believe there's a third waiver you're asking for in your uh, petition here, and I'm sorry, in your presentation here, and that is on page 10, uh, item D, and that's the fencing, correct? And just for completeness sake. It says stockade, stockade fencing, fencing, and you want to put in chain fencing. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Um, uh, yes, we'd be seeking a waiver that this facility is in the middle of the woods. There's no value in stockade. and we're, it's an unmanned facility, so we're mostly concerned with security, both um, uh, people trying to get to the tower itself. And longevity, I'm assuming, too. Exactly. Okay, and that's fine. I just wanted to make sure that, for the record, we understand that there are there's an additional waiver that needs I'm, to be I'm considered sorry, here. I didn't flag that suggestion. Okay, thank you. That is it for my end. Yes. I happen to be talking to you somewhat earlier in the week, oddly enough, about uh, private jets landing in and out of the Garden Municipal Airport. So they're outside that five, yep. this tower is outside yep. that five, so in the future there's no possibility of any lighting being um, put on that tower, as the I law currently states. Until you permit an airport in Hubbardson, um, which I have no control over, but uh, under current FAA regulations there's no need to light the tower. So Gardner is five miles, greater than five miles yes. from the tower location. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. At least ten miles from what I understand. Yeah. Thank you. Or, or thereabouts. Seven. That's close. Yeah. All right, uh, additional questions from the planning board? I have a uh, couple yes. comments if I can. Absolutely. Uh, so following up on the fencing. Um, the fencing you want is six feet, eight feet, and what's on top? Six feet plus barbed wire. Six feet with would be a run of barbed wire. Typical barbed wire, razor wire. What are you thinking? Tom, can you answer that? Uh, three strands of just typical barbed wire, not razor wire. Okay, and um, <clears throat> on, in terms of other security, is there? Is there like a security camera that's night activated? Is there, what What do you do for security? Um, there, there's, the, the fence will be locked. <coughs> yep. The, um, the cabinets themselves are, with the, the electronic equipment, are remotely monitored so that if they were open, the, the, the carriers themselves would get notice of that. Uh, but uh, there's no cameras or anything like that. It's just if there was an opening of the door, things like that, or if there okay. was and any kind of. Um, um, signage on the fence yes. as to who owns the facility and uh, just very small signs it says uh, for any information call 1-800 and there's a, a network operating center that lands the phone and uh, there's some safety signs that say you know don't don't stand here don't do that something like that okay okay and then just a couple of comments one of the, the studies in here shows the sites they actually looked at uh, and it was 21 sites, and this was the only one. And he, he sort of covered a lot of that. But um, what he says about the fall zone is, you know, it's a 150-foot tower, right? So it, the lot would at least have to be two and a half acres just so if the tower <coughs> went over in a tornado to meet that. You know, it wouldn't cross a road. It wouldn't hit a structure. So I do think, in my mind, this is a uniquely situated parcel. Uh, because it's you know in the center of town and it's the size it is so you could look at that study it does talk about the others don't meet setbacks they don't meet you know it was a, a definite a study right. uh, that was done um, we looked at all the lots in the town center district and it was actually quite easy to be perfectly honest because a lot of them are acre lots two acre lots, yep, half uh, acre lots. Uh, with residential use and things like that so so anyway i spent a lot of time looking at that that was persuasive to me i also wanted to say is uh past year of the planning board that's looked at a lot of surveys in town. Every survey that we've done, citizen survey, the master plan survey, among the top three or four problems in town is lack of cell service. And this bylaw was passed 20 years ago. Um, so, you know, here's somebody presenting an opportunity that 
that actually does cover the whole town and does prevent the proliferation of towers because it's going to have all the main carri carriers on it. So to me, just to me, that was um, quite persuasive. And I do think it is a problem. And I do think, you know, my family, my kids have moved here. They don't have landlines. Nobody has landlines anymore. So, you know, it's an emergency kind of situation. How do they get hold of somebody, right? And, and also, if we're trying to attract, uh, like, our trails in town for walking, I know if you do Dottie's Rock, which we walk all the time, you can't get a signal. So, you know, if you meet the bear or fall over the cliff or get lost in the woods, I mean, you know, it's a different time, but it is the 21st century, and I think that the planning board has some obligation to try to meet that need that's been so widely addressed. So um, so I just want to tell you we're mindful of that need and we're kind of happy that at least we had a proposal here. Um, what else did I want to say? Oh, I do think also I did go up to the site. I was one of the people that went up the day they put the balloon up. Um, and it's this, this tower, it's a 75 foot area they're clearing, but the base of the tower is actually only about half that, right? Uh, the, the fence is 60 by 60. Right, and the so, actual triangle that the tower right. is is about 30 feet on a side, maybe? The, um, the, the towers themselves are about, uh, it's a three-sided face, yeah. and they're about 20 feet, 20 feet, 20 feet, tapering um, to uh, about a foot at the top, but then the platforms themselves extend out about 12 feet, 12 feet, 12 feet. So uh, it's a, um, the, and the, fo the foundation, uh, might be 15 by 15, 20 by 20, if we had to do a, a, a mat type foundation. Uh, but it's, you know, compared to the 13 acres, it's really quite minimal. So, what you were thinking of in terms of being in a wooded, a heavily wooded lot, it's not a, a massive structure, you know, it's a pretty tight structure. The real question is what you see at the top of it, which was the balloon test. Which, um, and we have had criticism Sorry. on the planning board. We've got notices that said we, why didn't you leave, make him leave it up there all day? Why didn't you do it on the weekend? Why didn't, you know, we've gotten some of these questions and um, you can explain it further, but the explanation he gave us was that the winds in the afternoon pick up. And even when we were up there at nine o'clock, it was pretty hard to keep a balloon vertical on a string that far up. Um, so that's why we did the pictures and, um, Anyway, so uh, yeah, I'll tell you the um, balloons are a challenge, and uh, and one that what we have found is that um, historically, and not every day, but the wind tends to pick up as the day progresses, as the world warms up. So, and you required us to notice um, it was like 1,800 households, uh, which was extraordinary in our world. We've never done that before. Uh, the post office was awesome to work with, uh, uh, and uh, uh, and incredibly helpful. Uh, but you know, predicting weeks in advance of when the weather is going to cooperate for three hours or four hours is tough. Let alone eight hours or twelve hours. And, you know, your bylaw said put it up for twenty-four hours. Well, half of those hours are darkness, so there's no need to put a balloon up in the dark. It's not going to be lit. So, you know, uh, dark is dark is dark. Um, so, uh, you know, and we've struggled. Uh, I, um, um, anytime we try to do it uh, for longer lengths of time, we just create more problems. You know, if, if the wind was decent, which it was, and we even found on the day we put it up, it was very good for the first several hours, but then the wind was picking up toward the end, which just means that it's less reliable. And so the, uh, um, I took comfort in the fact that everybody in town got notice as opposed to um, picking a date that the... Uh, uh, so we actually, as a board, did agree. He didn't have to put the balloon up at night. And, yeah. You know, this is why we made some of the decisions. I had the opportunity to speak to some people in town, and they were looking forward. I got, I, I, the impression I got from speaking to them is that they were looking forward to seeing what the balloon looked like and how it related to the topography of the area. And from their opinion, and I saw it, okay, I coincidentally saw it, like I said, uh, they said, as soon as it went up, it came down, and they thought it was supposedly going to be up there for four hours, 
It was. It was up for the full four hours. Yeah, they thought it was only up there for two. So there was this misrepresentation that went around. Well, it would blow and then right. come back. Yeah. It, uh, you know, balloons are fickle with the weather um, and the wind. It, it, it was stable for most of the time. Uh, it did blow a little bit, but it, uh, um, you know, it's, um, the other alternative would be for me to bulldoze the road, which you told me I can't do, and put a crane up in the air, which uh, is, has its own issues. So it's, uh, and this is what your zoning bylaw requires. It's what every town requires, It's but it's based on no, the fickleness of the weather. That's it. Uh, additional yeah. questions from the planning board? Uh, and, uh, Mr. Damalia, just to check in with you to see if you have any questions online. No questions, thanks. I do have one additional question. Can you clarify, Mr. Caprizi, for the uh, public and for the board? I understand there's going to be multiple cell phone providers that are will be using space. But in addition to this here, I thought I, and I'm looking where I cannot find it. Uh, you have a lot of documentation here. There's also broadband. Can you explain what type of broadband uh, will be uh, situated on these towers? Broadband is a um, kind of a generic term. Um, the telecommunications providers that are out there now provide a broadband service, meaning a, and broadband is meaning a um, a data service, mm -hmm. just like you can get data on your Verizon phone now. Um, there are some um, telecommunications companies on the horizon that are only going to provide a data service because, quite frankly, a lot of voice is going away. People are texting and using internet access devices. So uh, there's one carrier out there now, Dish Networks, who uh, is really only going to provide a wireless internet and uh, terrestrial telephone service as opposed to a satellite service. So would it be fair to say that that will bring competition to the cable providers? Um, wireless in general does. You can get streaming video from your uh, wireless phone. It just requires a, a more reliable signal. But uh, um, they all kind of compete with each other. I understand. Uh, the, uh, well, it's um, an alternative. Right. Is what yeah. I'm hearing from right. you. Exactly. Okay. Thank you. I do have a question myself. Uh, how long well, does the tower operate if it's not connected to grid power, The grid uh, power fails? There's three sources of power. The primary power is grid power. Um, then there are backup batteries inside the cabinets and typically last 12, 15 hours um, in, in a, a, a short-term power outage. And then there may be some generators either uh, permanent or temporary brought on site in the extent of a long-term power outage. Uh, but it, it, uh, those, the, the generators are the, the last resort, not the first resort. It, it, it yep. runs on primary and the battery. Because I, I think of that myself a, a lot as a resident because uh, to the points that were raised earlier, I've not had a landline in years. Um, and I either use my cell phone or I use voice over IP. So if the power goes out, I have zero contact with the outside world at my house. If anything was to happen with my wife or child, nothing. I could hike up the driveway and maybe, maybe walk a mile or two down the road. So the, the idea that, uh, that there could potentially be service when there's no power. So I'll tell you, um, there's been lots of data to show that wireless communications is the most reliable telecommunications during natural disasters. Um, and what they found mm -hmm. out during Sandy um, was that um, wireless, uh, mm -hmm. you know, they, a lot of wires went down the batteries lasted 12, 15 hours, and then generators kicked in. But what lost power was the gas stations. And so the gas stations couldn't pump the gas or the propane in order to refuel the generators. So you actually see a lot of uh, gas stations now putting in generators in order to, um, that, that was to be a problem. It wasn't the lack of telecommunications infrastructure, it was the lack of gas, propane. Interesting. All right, so just to get a feeling of the size of the elephant, we're going to eat by a show of hands. How many comments are we running through? How many what? How many what? How many, what? Uh, how many people are planning speak? on commenting so I can get a ballpark of what we're looking at for time? I only want to say something. That's it. Because he can he can do whatever he wants. He buy the land. My wife we could be saying buy the land. I'm next to him. To him, you know, I'm 15. Okay. 
My wife is just buy the land. I says, no, I got enough for land, the 2.4 acres. So he is like in the middle for me. Tell him you're right next door on two sides. All the way down to Brigham Street. That's what he got a little bit of tango. Mm -hmm. And when I move over here, and I'm thinking okay, about, uh, um, I'm sorry, I need to cut you off because I need to try okay. to keep this organized because we have so many people. Um, I was just trying to get a, a feeling by show of hands how many comments to expect. Okay. How many comments? Comments. Three, four, five, six, six, seven, eight. So, again, please, everybody, raise your hands. How many people are? Happy to. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. So 11 individuals. Okay, and we are already at 8.30. And we are at 8.30. It's about three minutes, tops. Yeah, I would like to, well, well, first I would like to suggest that um, that we take a three or five minute recess. Uh, and then I would, uh, I would like to ask everybody, try to keep their comments to three to four minutes. Do you want to have well, their people's names on an, on a comments list, and then we'll just go, we'll do it by order and limit it to three minutes. So what we're going to ask while okay. while Come we're on. doing while we're doing the, the, just just trying to create some structure here to make it easier for yeah, people. Yeah, just because just like, we have so I got so many commenters. If somebody asks a question, then we don't need. When that move here? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So if there's eleven so, questions. Yeah, well, if you got to get going, we'll call on you first. So, yeah, we're we need to, we need to declare a recess. So I'm declaring a recess until uh, 8.30. Okay. Because that's about 34 minutes. You didn't sign Thank in. You. Your name is? Okay. Roger. 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 Roger.